We explore garden passions in today's show right after this. Smith, what are you passionate about? In today's show, we're going to take a look at garden passions. We'll visit a Dutch garden where we'll learn about their amazing collection of watering cans. Aren't these great? We'll follow the installation of an elaborate backyard water feature. These guys are certainly passionate about their work. You'll learn more about this environmentally friendly pond coming up. And I'll show you some of the plants I'm passionate about growing and collecting. Plus, we'll take a look at viewer mail. But first, I want to take you to a garden where the creation was the passion of the owner and designer. That story right after the break. Located on Long Island in New York, Old Westbury Gardens was once the home of the John Phipps family. Surrounding the home are 160 acres of formal gardens, landscape grounds, woodlands, ponds, and lakes. What captured my imagination about this place was the focus on family and fun in the midst of all of this formality and grandeur. Take, for instance, the whimsical cottage garden. You see, this was a family home for the Phipps, and they enjoyed it, and you can see elements of humor throughout. A touch of whimsy was important. You see, they had four children. They had all boys and one little girl, and when that little girl reached 10 years of age, she was presented with this little cottage complete with a thatched roof and an English cottage style garden around it. The garden encouraged the children to explore. Plants like the fuzzy lamb's ear, fragrant herbs, and the exuberant sparkler-like cleome, sometimes called cat's whiskers, stimulated their imagination. The tiny fairy roses and morning glories and cheerful zinnias along the picket fence also added to the magic. The mansion was built by the English designer George A. Crawley in the Charles II style. Pat, when I think of Old Westbury, I immediately think of the gardens, despite the fact that there's this magnificent house here behind us in a part of the estate. Well, that's because it's called Old Westbury Gardens. So the natural assumption is that it's just a garden and there is no house, and yet this house along with the garden and the grounds makes such a wonderful whole. Oh, and a harmonious whole. Yes, it does. Well, the house is, is a look back, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. The architecture is uh, much older than the house. Exactly. Um, it was built around the turn of the 20th century and completed in 1906. However, the style of it goes back to the er, middle 1600s. Well, the gardens are so incredible here. It's just one experience after mm -hmm. another. You have this yeah. beautiful pastoral landscape, mm -hmm. which certainly looks like uh, an English countryside, That's a right. scene from in the English countryside. That's right. And then when you get into the gardens themselves, one garden leads you into the next, into the next, yeah. just as you find an English garden. Exactly. And it's sort of that room going from one room to the next that Crowley was um, recreating here. Marvelous. Well, the, the, there's so many garden experiences here. Mm. I mean, you have the gray garden, you have the ghost right. walk, you have the rose garden. Exactly. And then that glorious walled garden. Oh, yes. It's just fantastic exactly. with the, the, with the uh, crescent uh, pergola at mm. one end. Yes, with the lily pond at its feet and um, the fountains, the way the fountain is just perfectly centered. Uh, it, it shows his uh, love of, of axes, of, of being able to look down a yes. long way and having a focal point. Right, the framed views exactly. are at every turn mm -hmm. and, and make yeah. for such a delightful experience. Exactly. From this grand estate to a more modest Dutch garden that's full of the same sort of garden passions, we'll meet George Don't and get some tips on design and collecting garden ornament right after the break. Large gardens, like the grounds of Old Westbury that we saw earlier, certainly offer us a wide array of areas to study good principles of garden design. But what I've learned over the years is that some of the best designs come in small packages. 
It's always interesting to see what people come up with when they design in small garden spaces, how they mix up colors, styles, and even garden ornament. During a visit to Holland one summer, I stopped to visit with George Horgevorst. I think one of the, the nicest aspects of this garden that helps also create interest is the garden ornament that is placed around. I mean, some things are, are very ordinary, like stacked clay pots and, and this uh, growing collection of watering cans that you and Marion have. Yeah, it will stop growing now because we decided to, to buy no more water cans. <laughs> too many. <laughs> because we have about 100 in the garden and it's getting too many. But we, we like to, to visit markets in, uh, or whatever, England, Belgium, north of France, and. Yeah, and walk around and see what we like to put in our garden. We're always looking for things in our garden. Right. We're never in the house, always in the garden. <laughs> for the garden. George, how long have you had a garden here? We live here for 24 years and uh, we started it. Uh, when we built this house, we started the garden as well. We had to because the, this field was used, uh, was used for the house, so we had to do something with the ground surrounding the house. So it was just a flat plane, yeah. a blank slate. I see. Now, Marion, she, she's a trained garden designer. Yes, yes. She had education uh, when we came to live here. She started education for four years. And um, during that period, she started already with the garden. And we changed that later on, because you, when you start. Well, sure, always changing. <laughs> yes, yeah. And you do a lot of things wrong. Well, it's really beautiful, George. And I particularly like this color scheme that you all have used here in this, this space. Thank you. Marianne, in, all, in the last autumn, she replanted all the, all the plants and, and uh, we put some more hedges of uh, Santolina. Oh, it's really nice. It, the gray really pops and stands out. Yes, I like it very much and it smells so good, yeah. uh, the Santolina. Well, it's really its own little garden room. Yes, it is, yes. George, I like the four trees that you've used to, to anchor the center of this garden. And it, it doesn't look like they cause much of a problem with uh, shade. No, we, we cut them all, uh, of course, to, to keep them in uh, shape. But uh, yeah, and also in the front of the garden, because we, uh, we live to a quite busy road, and it gives a lot of private uh, feeling when, when the side is blocked. Yes. And yeah, the garden does feel very private all the way around. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. it's nice. We continue this show on garden passions, up next with plants I'm passionate about. And a little later, a backyard pond makeover. So stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Alan Smith. You know, I'm really enjoying this show on garden passions. Earlier, we took a look at the gardens of Old Westbury. While this home sits amid formal landscape, it was fun and family that stood at the heart of the garden's design. It's evident that John Phipps and his family were passionate about creating an environment that was both kid-friendly and beautiful. We also went to the Netherlands, where George Horgevoort showed off the design his wife Marion created around their home. George also revealed that they are hopeless collectors of watering cans. Well, there you have it, proof that garden ornament doesn't have to be expensive. You know, I enjoyed seeing all of those watering cans tucked in nooks and crannies. It's like going on a treasure hunt as we toured the garden. Now, when we talk about plants, I certainly have my passions. I'd have to start with roses. You see, I've packed them into every possible location in the garden. My favorites are the old-fashioned roses, varieties like Lamarne, Catherine Zemay, Little White Pet, and Chatney's Pink Cluster. I also like some of the new varieties that mimic the qualities of older roses, such as New Dawn. It has both good fragrance and disease resistance, like the older varieties. I'm also fond of some of the English roses. And who can resist that adorable Polyantha, the fairy? It's such a great performer for me. When it blooms, it produces beautiful little sprays like these, perfect for an instant bouquet. I'm also fond of coleus. These rate high on my list of problem solvers in the garden. The brilliant color of the foliage and the fact that these perform both in sun and shade are what makes them such great plants. And of course, there's lettuce. Now, I have to say I'm a self-professed lettuce nut. Every fall and spring, I grow several varieties just so I can have fresh lettuce for using in salads. And I have to say, they really look great mixed in with other plants, such as tulips, parsley, pansies, and violas. Some of the varieties I grow include red sail, butter crunch, and deer tongue. I know you have plants that you're passionate about. 
which reminds me, we have a viewer question to answer. This viewer writes from St. Louis, her name is Sarah, and she loves African violets, a passion. But she says, I have several plants that I started from cuttings, and although they continue to live, they just don't seem very happy. Well, believe it or not, the African violet is probably the most popular house plant of all time. And they may be a little old fashioned, but you have to admit, they can bring a lot of charm to a kitchen, bedroom, or windowsill. Now what's great about African violets is that if you take care of them right, they'll bloom throughout the entire year. Now one of the first things you'll want to do is pay attention to those wrappers. They're not there just for decoration. They put them around the pot for shipping to keep moisture from getting on the leaves. You see, water can damage the foliage. That's why over the years, people have come up with clever ways to water African violets. One example is the string method. A string extends from the base of a clay pot and it simply draws moisture through the string from a container filled with water into the soil. This is not unlike the way a wick performs in an oil lamp. You can also water them from below, directly through the saucer. African violets like bright but not direct sunlight. Indirect light from the east, south, or west window is ideal. During the winter, you may need to supplement their daylight with some artificial light. You may soon discover that they actually thrive under these grow lights. It's important to fertilize each time you water. I use a formula specifically blended for African violets. It takes the guesswork out of it and makes it so much easier. Now I've got more on caring for common houseplants on my website, pallensmith.com. I've also got a free weekly newsletter I'd love to share with you. You can sign up online. There you can write in with any questions you might have. Now up next is the time in the show when we usually dedicate to a recipe, only this time the recipe isn't going to come from the kitchen. It's a recipe for success for garden design. So stay with us to learn about how this garden went from this to this, all with the help of water. Okay, if you're looking for a recipe for something good to eat, you'll have to go to pallensmith.com. There are plenty listed there. But if you're looking for a recipe for good garden design, well, you're at the right place. Nobody beats the team from Aquascape Design. I watch them as they transform the backyard of one of my design clients with water and beautiful stones. If your backyard looks like this, there's hope. Just ask my design client, Kathy Graves. Now, Kathy's a busy attorney with teenage children, so it was important to her for us to come up with a plan that she could implement over time. But let's be honest. No matter how long term of a garden home plan you're willing to take on, everyone likes to see results as soon as possible. We started with the front of Kathy's house, moving hedges, installing a custom designed gate. And while there's a lot of work left to be done to get it to the final stage, the family can now enjoy some of the early fruits of their labor. Now let's turn our attention to the back of the house, where we've decided that an elaborate water feature is just what this rustic woodland landscape needs. I've called in a team of experts to help me out. Let's slip down the hill and have a talk with Greg and see how things are progressing. Well, hey, Greg. Hey, Alan. How's it going? Good. Man, you guys are making some hay. Hey, moving dirt. I'm telling you, that's looking great. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll be a fun project. You know, a lot of people will say, I've got this backyard and it's a steep slope. I don't know what to do with it. I don't want to mow it. Oh, yeah. And a water feature like this is a perfect way to bring interest and beauty to the garden. Well, tell me a little bit about the approach you take, because yours is unique in the industry, isn't it? Yeah, what we try to do is create a backyard ecosystem so that we let Mother Nature do a lot of the maintenance instead of you having to do it. So what you mean by a natural ecosystem is one where you're not having to run out here and dump a lot of chemicals in the water. Right. Instead of trying to beat Mother Nature into submission, it's a lot easier to work with Mother Nature. There are five different elements that you um, employ when you create a pond. Any well-designed pond needs at least five different elements in proper balance. The first three, anyone can get very easy. Rocks and gravel. The rocks and gravel that go in the pond are a place for bacteria to live and break down nutrients that would cause green water or algae. An important part of the ecosystem. Yeah, rocks and gravel throughout the entire pond bottom and all the sides, covering up the liner. Next part is your plants. Obviously, as we all know, plants are an important part of an ecosystem and they also remove the nutrients that feed green water and algae. And can bring a lot of beauty to the pond itself. Absolutely, a lot of new, different kinds of plants. A whole new world of gardening is opened up with aquatic plants. And what would be the third? The third part is the fish. And a lot of people have misperceptions about fish, but you actually can actually leave your fish in there year-round. 
And people say, well, what about feeding them when we go on vacation? You don't have to feed them because they're part of a natural <laughs> ecosystem. The perfect pet. The fourth part is your circulatory system, the right size pump and the right size plumbing. Your fifth part is your filtration system. Well, now tell me a little bit about where we are in the process here. You've just gotten started. Yeah, we just started about an hour ago. What we typically do is we lay out with a garden hose. We freeform a shape down at the base of the um, where the waterfalls are going to go. And then we just start digging. We usually dig using our biceps and our triceps and shovels. Now, here, we're, we're, we're really right at the, the source or the origin yeah. of the spring mm -hmm. that will uh, yeah. spill out of the That's side cool. of the hill there, uh, under the, the path, and then down the hill to the basin. That's right. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a look just like a spring, just like you said, and uh, we're actually going to end up cutting out a section of the uh, a walkway and putting probably a flagstone on top of that and letting the water go underneath there so people can actually have the disappearing effect of the water yeah. and be able to see a little mystery. Is. That's right. Yeah, an important element mm -hmm. as well in garden design. This will become a very relaxing place. It'll absolutely change the environment. There'll be no other thing that we can put in this landscape that will have as much impact as this water feature will. Okay, let's check out the final product. Wow, what a difference. This backyard has gone through a complete transformation, and the water feature has been surrounded with cannas, hostas, elephant ears, and azaleas. And the flagstone bridge that Greg was telling us about earlier, well, it achieves that sense of mystery. The water just seems to disappear under the pathway. But one of the biggest and most outstanding changes to this backyard isn't what you see, rather it's something that you can hear. The way the water cascades off the rocks creates a soothing and relaxing sound, much better than the previous noise created by this suburban environment. This water feature has truly provided a natural barrier to unwanted sounds and created a backyard oasis for the homeowner to sit back, relax, and enjoy. Well, that's it for today's show. I can't believe it's gone by so quickly as we've explored passions in the garden. Hope you've been inspired by some of the people, places, and ideas that we've seen. Now, all of this is recapped on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden, I dream a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help 